And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Well, hey, let's get things kicked off uh, for a midweek edition. If you're just tuning into us on KFOR, it's uh, Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. If you're checking in, as always, uh, locally on 1015. Uh, same dudes can stream us as always on the Hale Varsity YouTube channel and Hale Varsity Twitter uh, feed at H Varsity Radio, uh, KFOR Facebook, KFOR Twitter is how you can watch the show. Numbers to get in today on Hale Varsity Radio four six six three seven seven six four six six thirty seven seventy six eight hundred eight two five. Five eight six five. Uh, you can email the show Chris at HaleVarsity dot com. So, what's on the docket today? Assuming you can hear me, we will uh, spend plenty of time on Nebraska basketball. Uh, smile and nod, Fred. Uh, Fred Hoiberg and company pulling off a wow win in Piscataway, New Jersey last night. Go ahead. Inch that way, get your hopes up just a shade for Nebraska basketball. Man, uh, what a turnaround it has been for Nebraska ball. So we'll get there. Uh, Husker baseball getting ready for the roadie to San Diego. We'll dive uh, headfirst into home plate with Mike Babcock from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Evan Bland will be with us in hour two. And uh, we'll go around the world of golf with uh, Mike Shuhart from Wilderness Ridge. Can uh, also be part of the show via a couple of different streams. I told you the different social media channels to find Hale Varsity uh, Radio on KFOR Facebook, KFOR Twitter, and uh, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Give us a follow on Hale Varsity Radio at H Varsity uh, Radio. So let's talk about last night. Are you shocked? Are you surprised? Are you mildly entertained? Well, uh, count all of it for me. I'm I'm absolutely entertained with Nebraska basketball. I'm very entertained with the grit and toughness this basketball team has continued to show. We'll hear from Fred Hoiberg here in just a moment. But uh, the things that are... Uh, you're used to as a Nebraska basketball fan, what, heartache? How many times have you checked in on social media and there's the the loop of somebody getting punched or kicked somewhere that's not nice? That's how you felt for years as a Nebraska basketball fan, uh, aside from the, the, the 90s golden era. Uh, Nebraska is making a push. And everything they've been through, they deserve it. They just keep on keeping on. And it's a loud statement. Just because you beat Rutgers doesn't save your job if you're Fred Hoiberg. You've won three of four. Doesn't necessarily save your job. But go back to Trev Albert's comments to the World Herald a couple weeks ago. And, you know, what's the competitive level What's the competitiveness of this basketball team down the stretch? And, well, Nebraska's competitiveness has been ultra high. They've not mailed it in. They've not checked it out. And in a lot of instances, many teams, past teams, with the mentality and personality makeup, would have totally checked out and mailed it in. The first two years, it was tough. Last year was tough. You had a little glimmer of hope. With Nebraska basketball, their talent finally buying into the message to start playing some defense, and they finished pretty strong. They they beat Ohio State, they upset Wisconsin, and you're like, man, I wish the, the, the whole year could have been like this. It wasn't. And this year with Nebraska basketball, it's a different lineup. It's a different group of kids for uh, Fred Hoiberg. It's Sam Greasel, the pride of Lincoln East, coming in. And and being absolutely blue collar, it's Uber veteran Derek Walker that has done everything in his power to be a leader and playmaker and, and also make plays for other others. What you haven't seen is some of these guys that were highly touted, highly regarded hit 
individually, yeah, but as far as as far as part of an offense or team makeup, uh, it's always kind of been a lot of different island chains. Well, how about Tomanaga and and the run, the heater Tomanaga's been on within the offense. Uh, you have C.J. Wiltshire going home to the Garden State last night and had a big ball game, his best game since Indiana, but his first best game in a win in a long, long time for Nebraska basketball. Wiltshire able to hit double digits. What you saw last night from Nebraska basketball was balance. They were not intimidated. There's no such thing anymore as adversity they're afraid of or scared of. You lose Bandamel and Gary, you could have absolutely tapped out and mailed it in. They haven't. They fought for Fred, and I appreciate that. And as a Nebraska basketball fan, you like this team with how they continue to just keep digging, man. Uh, Stranger things. How does the year end? Three weeks ago... After Gary, after Bandamel, I wondered out loud, do they win again? Does he get two wins at home? Well, (laughs) way off. Uh, Nebraska's won three of four. They get Maryland Sunday. They get Minnesota on the 25th. We're going to be down at Rosie's Roadshow for Hale Varsity Radio Tuesday the 28th for Michigan State. You end at Iowa. I'm not saying Nebraska wins out. Absolutely not, but it'd be cool if they did if you're a Nebraska basketball fan. You're within striking distance again of being being able to hover around 500 in the league. You're, you're four games under right now. So if you end the year 8-12, and 12, good for you. But can you, can you get to around 500 record-wise? Can you go 3-1? and one? Can, you go, can, you, can you be 16-15? and 15? Can you get to 15-15 and 15 and, and keep this season going for some sort of postseason basketball? I don't think that's an edict. I don't think that's a declaration at all by, by Trev to Fred. I don't think we're there. But you've seen this team – against a lot of odds it was funny he was listening to the post game last night with Rutgers and like the Rutgers media the the tone of their voice they were surprised they were disgusted how, how do you lose to Nebraska it's one thing to to beat Michigan State and then you go on the road and you lose a tough ball game under double digits to Indiana. You lose a tough ball game under double digits to Illinois. That's going to happen, okay, because of how good those teams are in the Big Ten. Now, Illinois got drilled by Penn State yesterday, but there's never an easy night in the Big Ten. We can have that argument with just what you think of, of Big Ten basketball. I've seen projections where there's nine teams that get in. There's eight teams that are getting into the dance We'll see if they keep beating up on one another and you're rewarded or detracted for it. But but the the media was shocked and appalled that Rutgers lost to lowly Nebraska, first of all. The Rutgers media was. Secondly, towards the end of, of the, uh, the Q&A with Fred, there's a guy that, that Rutgers didn't have that's pretty big with their press. And... <laughs> Don't whine to Fred about being shorthanded is kind of my thought on that. Fred's the last guy that's going to give you any sympathy of, well, you know, we didn't have so-and-so. Fred's like, tell me about it. We got a whole freaking bench of, of guys that, man, if I had them now and the way we're playing, maybe we're talking bubble. But Elijah Herbal joins after putting his fireman coat on. God love you for doing that you're shaking your head do i need to pour a drink this is water if you're watching on the stream and let us welcome uh our friends from from kfor to four to six now hail varsity radio uh if you're not used to this based on what you've been listening to on on kfor 
Give us two weeks. If you still hate us, give us two more weeks. <laughs> You're it's, not used to it, and guess what? Neither are we. Uh, sage and sound advice, but you, you hopefully hear us in the morning mm-hmm. on, on KFOR, and, and we're blessed to be a part of a lot of different uh, great stations across the Hale Var City Network. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're launching today. Uh, on uh, on KFOR here with uh, Hale Varsity four to six. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're excited. New uh, new signal in Lincoln where you can find us. So if you are looking for us, you find us on the uh, the live stream right now, and you're like, where are you guys at on the air in Lincoln? Twelve forty a.m. in one zero one five FM. So the FM signal stays the same. The AM signal changes though. Uh, KFOR is where you find us. Uh, we're happy to join you. But Schmidt, you're talking about Husker basketball, and my number one takeaway from last night. And I know I have been very hard on this Husker basketball team at times this year, and you know what? At times it's been deservedly. They're so. hard. They've been hard to believe in because they'll show promise mm-hmm. and progress and get a a nice win through just absolute they're not the most talented team almost nine and a half times out of ten they step on the court but they found a way nebraskans appreciate that there's something to be proud of that was my takeaway from last night is watching that team is no they're not the most talented team on the floor are they going to go dancing this year probably not if not not, they reenact jimmy v yeah they need a miracle and they need to go undefeated to to close the season now you have some home games i I think you can have a a happy finish to the year i don't think that involves dancing but what this team is do not count out the big 10 tournament (laughs) sure sure right sure i mean (laughs) your money not mine right I, i mean they they play in a way that the state of Nebraska can appreciate and the state of Nebraska can be proud of and when was the last time you could say that about a husker basketball team probably that tournament team 20, think, 2013 was probably the last time you were truly I, I proud the, of this Husker I, I basketball team. I think the team, the team that, that, that Timmy had with, with Palmer and company that got slighted. And the the year up, right after the tournament? About 2018, Nebraska had a, a – they were they were a bubble oh, team. Oh, Palmer. Ended up, uh, Palmer, yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not Tra- Austin away. <laughs> not, not, not Trey. <laughs> not, not Trey Palmer. But, no, Nebraska basketball is is making you proud. At least they followed up success mm-hmm. with success. Uh, I don't know. Maryland's pretty tough, but even in Nebraska's losses this year on the road, they they have they have still fought like hell. They have still they they've been getting blown out of the water. It looked really bad, and it may finish bad, but their stretches against Maryland and against Michigan recently, right when they've been on the road, where if they make a play or two here or there. They, they get back to the final six minutes of this game could go either way. They didn't make those plays in those games, but they didn't cave in. It still looks in the final tally, you lose by 19 or 20 plus. But in, in a lot of instances, past teams would have lost by 30, which they have. They've gotten drilled before. But no, uh, it's, it's impressive with what Fred and Nebraska is doing. Be proud of them. Enjoy the moment. Get down to PBA Sunday to Sunday matinee for you um, against a Maryland team that they're 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 near the they're, top end of the conference they but they have been awful on the road sure terrible they're 13 and one at home meaning that their nine other losses have come on the road it's a team that is beatable if you get them mm-hmm. on the road the Husker basketball team's been playing their best basketball at home We'll get into some discussion points uh, our, our dear friend Mike Schaefer putting a crystal ball out earlier this week uh, on Dylan Riola to Nebraska. We'll get to some Husker football in hour two with Evan Bland. Uh, Mike Babcock is about five minutes away. Let's hear from Fred Hoiberg and uh, get Fred's take last night. Uh, the Big Red did what they needed to do, and they came in with a high level of confidence. We, we really prepared for pressure, and it's what they do. They're the best in the league at it. At, at getting their hands on balls and getting deflections and creating turnovers and we knew they would come out aggressive uh, coming back off the road trip at home so the first five minutes it was very important and we got off to a good start and they they were hitting shots early cj got us off to, off to a great start hit, hitting three threes and, and keeping us right there and that is what allowed us to i thought stay competitive for 40 minutes uh the start to cj we're kind of rotating that fifth spot around right now with with the injuries that we've had uh but cj i thought was terrific of getting us uh off to exactly the start that we needed uh i got a little careless with it early i thought had had, went after it with one hand you just can't do that against uh against this rutgers team Uh, mcconnell spencer mulcahy all those guys their hands uh that we challenged cliff at the rim on a couple of occasions too that leads uh and fuels our fast breaks 
but overall, I thought we played with pretty good poise, and we had a lot of young guys out there on the floor. Got loud out there as it always does at the rack. This is a great one of the great environments in college basketball, and I, I just thought our guys played with the poise that they needed to uh, to give ourselves a chance to win. Fred Hoiberg nailed it. He had the answer. That was poise. Uh, poised by Nebraska, you want definition? How about how Nebraska finished? They finished against Rutgers 7 for 9 from the floor to close the ball game. Get this, 6 for 6 from the free throw line. I was waiting for it to go sideways. I was waiting for Rutgers to put a final push together and break your hearts and protect home court. Uh, Tomanaga, Sam Greasel, Derek Walker did not let that happen. Walker, 8 for 10 from the floor. Tomanaga, another 20-point masterpiece. You've been waiting for C.J. Wiltshire. Wiltshire's better, it almost feels like, when he's taking tough shots and someone's contesting him. He struggled more with some of the wide-open kickouts where there's been no one around him. And, and he delivered at home. Home for him being New Jersey. Great to be with you on a Wednesday. Hail Varsity Radio presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Mike Babcock on the way next with Hail Varsity. And now. And now back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. You can find us on socials, KFOR, Facebook. Watch the show and uh, also listen to the show, 101.5 FM, 1240 AM, uh, locally in Lincoln, 590 in Omaha. Our friends in Carney, Hastings, Grand Island, Columbus, uh, the KFOR Twitter handle, and of course, Hail Varsity Radio Twitter at H Varsity Radio can watch and stream the show there. The Hail Varsity YouTube channel. Uh, I, I don't have any makeup on, just a stocking hat in preparation of heavy amounts of snowfall. Mike Babcock is wearing his. I like that lid. Mike Babcock is with us, historian, author, Hall of Famer from Hail Varsity. A little polo love, Babs? Yeah, yeah. I pulled that out today. Uh, I don't know if it would be a defense against snow, but... <laughs> it's, it's, it's keeping the dome covered. I like it. I like it. This is a no no kidding. I've known Mike for a lot of years, and Mike's been so important to me and is. And about twice a year growing up, I'd always bump into Mike. Mike and I'd be uh, perusing the sale rack at, at some store that has polo gear. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would th- then yeah. we would paper rock scissors for who gets the sale item. I love it. Mike would win. Mike would win. It'd be good. Uh, Mike, uh, Nebraska basketball. Let's start there. We'll get to Husker baseball and some football in a moment. But uh, Fred's just gotta be not enjoying the the adversity, but he's gotta be enjoying his team's response. He is he has shown a ton of character, but his kids have have also kind of followed his lead. Yeah, and how many different starting lineups have they, have they had? 80. Uh, and how many adjustments <laughs> that have they had to make? But uh, I was really impressed with the way they played last night. And, you know, that was the C.J. Wilcher that we saw earlier in the season. And, and uh, you know, that really, that really helped, I think, get him off to a good start. And, you know, Derek Walker was doing what he does. You mentioned eight for 10 from the field. And nobody nobody loves basketball more than uh, Tominaga, I mm. think. <laughs> uh, he, he's just uh, uh, he, he's a spark. And it, it's amazing. You know, it's the, the Japanese Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he's got that nickname. And, and uh, you watch him play and you think, yeah, that's that's probably right. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, venues you would least likely uh, shush the crowd in. I'm probably drafting Rutgers and Jersey probably second or third in the Big Ten to, to taunt 
or or have a little fun with the the student section. He hits that three, and he's kind of like pushing both palms towards the floor. Just calm down. I got this. Is what he's telling the crowd. And uh, I was waiting for a uh, you know Christopher Moltisanti or or Anthony Soprano Jr. to to, to run out of the the, the 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 stands. I'm joking, of course, but man, he does have a ton of fun. And if you're hitting him from from Steph Curry land, go for it. Do it while you're hot, man. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing uh, what he can do. And, uh, you know, it's not just the three-pointer. That's that's what we see, but um, uh, we kind of associate that with him. But he's also uh, – he'll also drive and make a move, and he's done some under the basket, back over the – over the head kind of shots that have mm-hmm. been pretty remarkable, I think. And, and, uh, again, th- the energy is important too, I think. Um, but, uh, you can certainly use an offensive guy like that. And then when, when Wilcher's shooting the way he was, um, and, uh, Greasel is aggressive and just a gritty player, um, all the pieces fit there. And, uh, you know, I think it's well, now the next three games, three of the remaining four games are at home, right? Yes. And then and they finish at Iowa. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it's in a position where Nebraska can continue this aggressiveness and uh, play as it has played defensively, even though uh, two of its best defensive players are gone uh, for the season. Um, I think there's reason for optimism down the stretch. I don't know if they can get to 10 and 10, but um, certainly I think that the, would have never thought that we'd be in this position uh, a couple of games ago. Mike Babcock's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Mike, dare I say Nebraska basketball, and I know we've got to talk baseball here in a second, but dare I say Nebraska basketball, the hottest team in the Big Ten? Is that is that reasonable to say with just how much they're outperforming expectations? Yeah, I think but compared to expectations, when you put that in there, yeah, I think that's right, Elijah. Um but you look at the standings in the conference; it's it's everything's kind of jammed up there after after Purdue. Yeah, you got the, you got the top uh, three pretty much, and then it's just a log jam in the middle, and then you got Minnesota yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, for at this point right now, given expectations and where Nebraska is, the way Nebraska's played the last two games, and it, it has to be one game at a time. You can't start looking forward, you know. Um, certainly with this team, but uh, I think at this point, Nebraska is probably the uh, uh, most surprising team in the last uh, two games. Mike, uh, Nebraska is going to escape snow. That's the plan anyway, and uh, jump on a jet, get down to San Diego tomorrow. And as you look at this Husker baseball team, Coach Bolt kind of confirming his top three arms and who solidified some spots. Give me a player or two that you think will will be the barometer for this baseball team this year. Well, I think, you know, you got to look at the guys coming back, obviously, in, in, in the infield, Bryce Matthews, Max Anderson. Um, Emmett Olson, you know, that's pretty impressive that he got the opportunity to be the opening day starter. Um, but the guy that, you know, that they said a lot about, uh, Caleb Clark, um, and he's going to be the third third day third game starter, um, freshman from Canada. Um, really looking forward to uh, seeing what he does and what he has because uh, Will Bolt hasn't held back in in, in talking about him, and uh, so I think that's impressive. But you know you got the guys coming back, including uh, as I said, uh, Bryce Matthews and Max Anderson. I think those guys are are uh, really talented guys, and I think they're going to pro- provide some leadership in the in the middle of the infield. Do you think Max, and, and I know Will talked about it a little bit, but Max Anderson's trying to have a he, – he's such a, a worker and such a talent, but the, the pressure part of baseball is very real, where you put so much on yourself and that dish, when it's going great, man, it can be the, the best thing ever. Or if you're going up struggling, squeezing it too hard, it can really torment you. It sounds like Max right now has got a a more calm 
let's have some fun approach. That's what he's going into this year with, opposed to a year ago where he, he wanted it so hard he was, he was maybe squeezing a bit too hard. Yeah, well, I think what was you know coming off that freshman season with all the, the recognition that he got, you know, I think there was pressure there. I think now that it, going into his third season, I think he has things in control. I think he understands um, that he has to maintain some kind of a level of you know don't push too hard, um, just let it go, let the game come to you, kind of thing. That's cliche. I shouldn't use that. I don't. I don't like that cliche, but. Um, uh, I think that his experience puts him in a position where he's now comfortable and he's going to be playing second base. You know, that's a whole uh, different kind of a thing. So um, he gives them that kind of versatility. And that's the thing that is impressive about, about this team, I think, is that you've got guys that can play in, in multiple places like like Max Anderson. Um, he can do, you know, second base, third base, first base, whatever um, kind of a thing. And I, I think that's a positive and i've always been a bryce matthews fan so i'm, I'm a little biased there mike babcock's with us here talking some husker baseball and hail varsity radio and mike the rotation starting rotation at least to start the season looks a little different from last year friday night starter for now emmett olsen saturday is going to be jace kaminska the transfer from wichita state where he spent a couple years in the rotation and then the sunday starter caleb clark is one of the top uh, baseball prospects out of canada he's on the canadian junior national team and now he steps into a, a big sunday role with the huskers yeah, and uh, Kaminska, it, 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 Kaminska and Olson, it, it's basically an either or kind of a thing. Is what what Bolt said, you know, like one A, one B kind of a thing. But and as I said earlier, I think it's kind of remarkable that you got this freshman coming in from Canada, and he's already in the starting rotation. You know, the third guy. He's already starting Sundays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then they're going to decide on Monday. You know what what's going to happen, but um, so. You go left, right, left. You've got a good balance there. Um, I, I just, I think they have the potential to have the starting pitching um, to 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 get the job done. But you know, we'll, we'll see. And it, you know, that's a thing. You don't want to put too much too much on the first series of the season. Although Will Bolt said, "Hey, you want to win right away, establish that kind of a thing." But it's a long season. You've got an opportunity to do a lot of things this is a good place to start and, and get some guys some some confidence and uh, an opportunity to, to build some momentum if you can win some games uh, in San Diego. But there's some adjustment that's going to be that you're going to have to adjust a little bit, I think. Mike, about 90 seconds before we got to get out, uh, World Herald reporting, Alante Brown, Hunter Anthony no longer on the Nebraska roster. Quick reaction. Um. It kind of surprises me, uh, but uh, not because, you know, we, we, they had 103 guys on the roster. They got to get it down to 85. There's this uh, mindset that, hey, if you don't feel like you're going to fit in, um, we'll give you the opportunity. We'll help you make a transfer or whatever. There may be an element of that. Um, we're we're going to see some of that going forward because they got to get down to 85 by the by the time they open the season in the fall. So. Um, there are going to be some probably other other guys that are going to be in the same position. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of surprised that those guys are leaving. But, uh, yeah, that surprises me. Well, Alante Brown's a guy that you were just kind of waiting to see more opportunity. When he was asked to make a catch or a play, he did it. He was incredible on the edge. Uh, opened up a lot for Nebraska uh, with those little bubbles. Uh, was such a great edge blocker. But uh, big time talent, and uh, enjoyed watching uh, Alante Brown. Hunter Anthony was uh, a guy they they turned to until Ben Hart regrouped at right tackle, and he was a transfer from Oklahoma State. We'll have more thoughts on this. Mike Babcock from HaleVarsity dot com and Magazine at MD Babs on Twitter is where you follow him. Mike, thanks for a few minutes today, bud. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. There he is, Mike Babcock with us. We'll uh, check in uh, out at Wilderness Ridge. He might be uh, teeing off in a parka. Mike Schuhart's on the way. And uh, coming up, more thoughts with Nebraska football in hour two. Evan Bland will join us. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. 
Big thanks to Mike Babcock. You're tuned in to Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you're doing all right. Can email the show, Chris, at HaleVarsity.com. Numbers to dial up at 466-3776. Wednesdays, we always catch up with our dear friend Mike Schuhart, Wilderness Ridge, Wilderness Ridge Golf uh, uh, in Lincoln. And Shuey, what's the... What's the worst wind you faced, my friend? Because uh, as we, we gear up for old man winter coming off the top rope with two steel chairs, I, I'm anxious to hear the gale force you've had to, to, to tee it low and swing easy when it's breezy into. How are you today? I'm doing awesome. I've had a few of those days. <laughs> I have, I have. So... Uh, probably the worst I've ever played was at Kiowa Island. Okay. Kiowa Island, the famous uh, war on the shore hmm. when the Ryder Cup was played there, and Bernhard Langer missed that little putt for the U.S. to win. I can't hmm. remember what year that was. That was a long time ago. But that same hole, the 17th hole, which is a part three, I hit a Three wood to it, just trying to get it on land. And then the very next day, I hit nine iron. Mm. Mm, from the same yardage. Leo, what do you need? Man. Got to switch clubs up. That's a lot of clubs to switch. Oh, that's, so, that, 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 that's brutal, but... Did it did it end up okay with uh, with the switch? Did you did you make the right call, or are we moving on to the next question? Both, both times I got it on land, which was an accomplishment, so that's good. <laughs> where most guys were hitting it in the water, so at least yeah. I kept it out of the water. And then another time, I got three stories with that. So Pebble Beach, they just played Pebble Beach not too long ago. The seventh hole is a little par three, mm-hmm. and it's like a hundred and 10 yard shot so i had hit five iron to it one day and i hit my five iron like 190 (laughs) so that was a crazy win and you're elevated so you got to keep it down the wind was howling but probably the best wind story i've ever had was i'm playing at cyprus same tournament uh it was called the at&t at that time and I was fortunate enough to play Cypress Point, which they don't play anymore. The last year they played the tournament there. And I'm playing with Howard Twitty and Mike Donald. And I got to the 16th hole, famous 16th hole, uh, kind of an island green, sits on the ocean, rocks all around it, really cool. I had birdied the hole before, so I had the tee first, and the wind is howling. And I looked at my caddy, and I'm like going, I don't think I can get it there. It was a par three. I said, well, you got to be able to get it there because they wouldn't put it here if you couldn't. So I teed my driver up, and I hit it as hard as I could, and I bounced it right off the rock short of the green. And, oh. and I'm, I don't know how to play this hole. I can't hit it far enough to get it there. And it, you, there's, no, there's no bailout that it looks like. Well, then the other two guys got up and hit, and they pulled out irons, and they hit it directly to the left over the bushes, and I had no idea what they were doing. Well... I decided to follow them, not knowing what the heck I was doing. And I knew Mike Donald, so he was, we were talking as we went. And he said, yeah, when the wind's blowing that hard, that's how you play the hole. So the 17th fairway sits over the top of the bushes. You just hit it in the 17th, and then you try to hit it on the green and see if you can one putt for a par. Because when the wind blows that hard, nobody can get it on the green. Well, they were all laughing at me because I was stupid and didn't know that. <laughs> and I hit it right in the water. Now, Mike, is there ever a, a time when it's just more advantageous to go up there and hit a ground ball? Just go, you know, pull out the driver and just, I mean, you're talking about 105, 110-yard par three. Is there ever a time to just pull out the driver, hit a ground ball, and hope it rolls up onto the green? No question. No question. That's called good golf strategy. <laughs> See, I do that on all my golf shots. See, so. Well, <laughs> I, I'm talking about hitting it to the wrong fairway. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I do that about There, there are times, times whenever our golf wilderness. styles are working out, Schmitty. The pros are following us instead of the other way around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Mike Schuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Uh, Shuey, uh, thoughts on some of Rory's comments about the PGA Tour? 
uh, his take. It should be more like uh, NBA build build around the stars. And of course, you got uh, Live Golf League uh, continuing to recruit and pay. And I know their ROI uh, has has not been good, but they've been accumulating players. But what's your take on on Rory and? I mean, you've had such an explosion in golf with the Tiger factor, but you've got a whole new generation of golfers because of the Rory's, and you've got such a young contingent of talent, more and more. And you see it every day with the the, the academy you have at Wilderness. You have young kids every year that, that get involved. Uh, they like what they see, or their, their folks get them involved. And touch on the regeneration of golf and, and just being able to, to capitalize on, on the youth. Yeah, and I mean, it's like, it, that's why you've seen, you know, I saw this, at least, I, I call it the X Games, because mm-hmm. when the X Games became popular, I see golf following kind of that trend. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because of the, the next generation of golfers are a little different. I mean, they're brought up different. They're, they, they play the game uh, for different reasons, for the enjoyment of it, this and that. You know, I'm a little old school, so it's like I'm, I'm from the old school where it was, you know, buttoned up shirt and this and that. And it's like, you know, you have to change with the times and what people are enjoying, why they're enjoying it. And you have to uh, you have to change with that time. Just just watching your average golfer playing on the golf course, the things that have changed so much that are just normal now, you got to have a speaker on your cart. I mean, that's it. just you put your speaker on, you turn your music on, and you're playing. I mean, that is just a given. Everybody and their brother has that, you know. So it's like that, you know, when I grew up playing golf, man, that was, you did not do that. It was quiet, stand there quietly. It's like, no, now it's guys got their hats on backwards. Uh, they're wearing collarless shirts. They got their speakers going, their music going, you know, and it's it's like you see at, the waste management, you know, 16. I had a friend of mine send me a picture from 1995, what it 16th hole looked like to what it looks like now. And it's incredible. I mean, it's a, it's a stadium in there now, you know, and people are cheering and booing. And, <laughs> and so it's like, that's, that's the way golf is. It's like, it's again, it's like the X games. And then you had guys like uh, Ricky Fowler, mm-hmm. very, you know, recognizable out there. So, you know, when Rory makes the comments, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of on both ends because I've been on both ends. Sure. More on the other end, which is I'm that guy trying to get there. So it's like I want those opportunities. But the reality of it is who do people watch? I mean, they watch the superstars. Mm-hmm. You know? And the more recognizable those superstars can be, the more charismatic they are, and, you know, the more intriguing they become. And, and the more people want to get interested in that because they're interested in that guy, you know. Chewy, real quick, bud, about 10 seconds. What's happening at Wilderness? This was fun to get caught up today. Yeah, it was great. We opened up our our uh, new members bar and grill area called the Timbers. It's fantastic. I sent out a tweet. We had a soft opening, and it was crazy number of people, and it's been absolutely fabulous. So one of these days I'm going to get you out there, and we're going to – sit down and have some popcorn and have a drink and enjoy that fire pits were going. So that that's good. been exciting week. We got that all open and having the members finally have uh, the experience in it. Chewy, we'll do this soon, buddy. Appreciate you. Thanks for the time. All right. Love it. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. And now, and now back to Hale varsity radio. Back in, Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. Big thanks to Mike Schuhart. A few folks on social media saying, do you know that Hunter Anthony and Alante Brown are no longer on? Yes, thank you. We, we touched on it about 30 minutes ago. And Evan Bland is 10 minutes away. He's uh, reported that with the World Herald. So get Evan's take on things, not only baseball, but uh, Nebraska. Listen, you knew there was going to be turnover. There was going to be... Uh, some folks uh, moving on with the transition, and um, Nebraska is going to have to to find their their best seven or eight wide receivers. And Alante Brown was one of those guys that you were waiting to see more from. He's continued a he had continued a steady build in Lincoln, 
really good blocker, guy that's got some shake and bake, and and really um, uh, somebody that was uh, beyond a contributor. He was important in that wide receiver room. There's other options. Uh, what I don't know is, do you have other options in that room that are at the level of Alante Brown, or do you have more upside? Alante is probably like, all right, man, uh, I'm here. What's gone on is gone on. <laughs> From a transition standpoint, it's been nothing but change since I've came to Lincoln. I've given it the old, I'm going to hang in and do best for the team. I'm going somewhere else now. Good for him. Uh, good for him. If he finds a better opportunity in a home, uh, you're just going to miss having a, a, a talent like that in the room. But there will be other options. Uh, you just never – he was building towards a nice ceiling. Mm-hmm. And, and he'll end up touching that ceiling uh, somewhere else. You, well, you just with, – with Alante, you, you were always wondering, was he ever going to hit that ceiling at Nebraska? You always saw this ceiling, and you always saw him building towards it. The question was, was he ever going to reach that ceiling? And I think now with – a new coaching staff coming in. Uh, there's new competition in the room with a guy like Billy Kemp. You just look at it and, and, and you go... Slot guy, similar build. You, you, go, right? you know what? Sometimes it's just time for a, a change of scenery, a mm-hmm. change of scenery to spark some things. And Alante Brown looked like a guy who needed a, a spark in his career to, to kind of go and reach that ceiling. And you thought maybe it was going to be competition in the room mm-hmm. with a guy like Kemp. You thought maybe it was going to be new coaching staff. And turns out it's, uh, it's going to be a change of scenery for Alante Brown. And as is with all these guys that we're going to be talking about leaving the program within the next couple of months... You wish them the best just because mm-hmm. it didn't quite work out how they envisioned whenever they went to Nebraska. It didn't work out how we thought it was going to work out, but mostly for them. It didn't It didn't work out how they thought it was going to work out at Nebraska. So you hope they go find somewhere that they can go reach their ceiling. Well, Alante Brown, I mean, this is this is his fourth wide receivers coach. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And and that's, that's not ideal for anybody. Jared uh, checks in on the stream. USC's lost a 6-4 wide receiver. Robinson, any chance that he winds up at Nebraska? Well, uh, I think you're um, in the right mind frame, Jared, as a lot of Nebraska fans. Yes, come to our room, six foot four USC level of wide receiver. Come on down. Don't know where Nebraska's at. We'll uh, reach out to uh, to Evan on that. We'll have plenty of room open phones also for a bit in hour two. Reminder to get buckled up uh, using your seatbelt. It saves lives. It prevents injuries only if properly worn. Buckle up. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. First time for a lot of you here in Hale Varsity Radio. Thank you for giving us a try. First time for a lot of you hearing us over on KFOR. That's not a, a reaction show. So uh, appreciate you uh, checking us out. Facebook and Twitter, KFOR Facebook and uh, Twitter with ESP uh, with Hale Varsity Radio and of course the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Hour two next. Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Into hour two, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal can find us uh, on air. Uh, across the Hale Varsity Radio Network and on socials, KFOR Facebook and KFOR Twitter, Hale Varsity Radio at H Varsity Radio on Twitter is where you find that. Watch the show on all those platforms as well as the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Uh, Omaha's uh, very own Evan Bland, Omaha World Herald, joins us at Evan Bland OWH on Twitter. Evan, are you bundled up? How you doing? Yeah, Snowmageddon uh, 2.0, you know, whether that's zero inches like it seems to be or something turns into it, uh, ready to roll. Good for you. Uh, Snowshoes are on. (laughs) You are going to stow away in the equipment bag. I know you. And you're going to find your way down to uh, San Diego, man. Good for you. I, I hope. I hope you can stow your way down to San Diego with Husker Baseball getting going here this weekend. I wish. Yeah, I mean, it would be, you know, that the weatherman job out there is the easiest in the world, right? 70s and, and sunny and nice. And what better way to start the college baseball season? Fortunately, I'll be watching it on whatever the stream is for the, uh, you know, Western 
we're West Coast Conference uh, Network, but uh, yeah, it'll be a good start for the team and, and a pretty cool environment to see how they get rolling here in 2023. Let's uh, let's start with baseball. We'll get to some Husker football news. I know you, you have news on Alante Brown and Hunter Anthony. We'll, we'll get there in just a moment. But but overall, what's your, what's your takeaway uh, with Nebraska baseball as far as uh, Will Bolt, uh, the rotation, and specifically some of these pieces back trying to either have a bounce back or add to success. Do they, do they feel confident uh, beyond the, the image that's being presented? Do you think they, they can be for real this year? Well, it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition because I think the expectations internally are always pretty high, pretty consistent. I mean, they've since the staff has been here, they have not been shy about the fact that their standard is to contend in the Big Ten and to be in the hunt to host an NCAA regional. And they haven't done that as a program since 2008, so that's a pretty high uh, starting point. But you sort of contrast that with what the national perception is, and you kind of look around at some of the different projections uh, you know, at the national level, and, and Nebraska's uh, right in that four, five, six range, depending on where you look. I, I personally think that they can be a top three or top four team in the league, and when I look at what Nebraska needs to do in 2023, uh, to me it hinges on how the offense comes together, because I can look at the pitching, and I think the coaches would agree, and, and you can objectively look at that and say, with Emmett Olsen and Jace Kaminska as your Friday and Saturday starters, uh, you've got one of the top one-two punches in the league, and then you, you bring in Caleb Clark, and we'll see what he can do as a true freshman. But they like what he does on Sunday. The depth in the bullpen is such that you still have multiple guys who are former Friday night starters, either at Nebraska or elsewhere, who are coming on in relief. Uh, you, you have a lot of options and experience there, so you feel pretty good about it. And defensively, you look at Nebraska's entirety uh, in the Big Ten. You go back 10, 12 years, they've always been at worst a- uh, average defensively and at best you know, a top 10 type unit um, that, that just it, is really strong in the field. So you expect that those two pieces will come together. To me, it's about what does that offense look like because uh, you know, it, it was a group that didn't hit very well last year. They didn't hit for much for power. Uh, they weren't clutch necessarily. They didn't have a ton of, of speed on the base paths. They couldn't bunt all that well. And so you look at some of the top pieces that are coming back, you would think Max Anderson and Bryce Matthews could rebound to what they were two years ago and, and take another step forward. You like what Garrett Anglin brings you in the outfield. And then you look at what they did in the transfer market, bringing in uh, you know guys like um, – Casey Burnham in center field, the Kansas transfer, who's going to be a real threat on the base paths. You look at uh, Dylan Carey being the everyday third baseman as a true freshman and how high uh, the staff is on him. You look at um, Charlie Fisher at first base or in the outfield, the transfer from Southern Miss. So you can kind of see how these pieces come together. And I'll be curious not only – you know, do they score runs, but how do they score runs? Because I don't know that this is a group that's necessarily set up to mash 80 or 90 home runs the way that you see a lot of top teams doing, but can they put the pressure on the defense the way that some of the Nebraska's best teams have done? Can they be aggressive on the base paths, go first to third, take their walks? And I think if they can do that, and that's sort of the, the group to me that, um, you know, it can maybe take Nebraska from a good season to being one that contends for the Big Ten and get into a regional. Evan Bland with us from the World Herald uh, at Evan Bland OWH on Twitter. It's Hale Varsity Radio previewing Nebraska baseball. They get after it on Friday down in San Diego. And Evan, this team had just a ton of one run losses last year. And that is the that is the sign of a of an it year for for pick a baseball team from any year. How were they in one run games? How were they in late innings? And is that just a, an execution talent thing, or is it a is it a mental thing to you? And do you think they can be they need to be better? Yes, but do you think they have the the ability to be better uh, after going through so many near misses last season? Yeah, the one-run game thing is interesting. I think it it says a couple of things. I mean, first of all, your best teams in college baseball, honestly, they don't play a ton of one-run games. They they win by a lot or they pull away. 
and there's just not a ton of drama, you know, outside of maybe some of their bigger conference weekends. So I think the fact when you think back to Nebraska last year and they had a, a bunch of home games in midweeks in March and they had some walk offs and they had some losses and it was just like it felt like sort of a red flag for what was to come there. And and that, you know, had to do with the offense. It had to do with not necessarily being clutch. I think, you know, as much as anything, it had to do with the pitching injuries, though, that they had because they felt like that was a team that was going to be built from the back uh, toward the front where you had a guy like Jake Buns, you know, who was hurt, um, uh, multiple other relievers that they were counting on who went down or or just, uh, you know, weren't able to stay on the field for whatever reason. And when you remove all those arms on the back end, it does. It, it exposes you a little bit. Um, you know, there's kind of this adage in college baseball that you really want to get to a team in like the sixth, the seventh inning, because most teams maybe have that high end arm in the eighth or the ninth, but it's hard to cover those middle innings. And that was really exposed, I think, with Nebraska last year, too, with some of the injuries that they had, was they were putting guys out there after the starters maybe came out in the fifth or whatever, uh, that were sort of having to learn on the fly. Or if they did go with their higher leverage arms, then uh, the eighth and the ninth became a little bit more of a of an adventure than they wanted it to be. So I think, you know, it, it sort of goes hand in hand where, again, right now they're healthy, knock on wood. There's depth there in the back end where they feel like if a starter can give you six, then they can hand that off seventh, eighth, ninth inning to maybe three different guys and feel pretty good about it. And you combine that again with an offense that can be, at the very least, average nationally. I think Nebraska is going to feel like it's going to be in a spot where it's either not in as many of those sort of situations or it'll be in position to win them uh, with, a, with a lead in the middle innings. Evan, last thought here on baseball before we switch gears and talk some Husker football. What does a successful opening weekend look like to you for this Husker baseball team? Well, the opponent on the other side is no slouch. I mean, San Diego went to a regional last year. They have a lot of their better pieces back. I think the strength of that team is probably on the hitting side, although they have a pretty good freshman class coming in, too. And you look at some of the the, uh, the rankings nationally on freshman classes and things like that. So, you know, to me... I think at worst you got to probably split it the weekend. Um, you know, both teams have announced their starters, and San Diego is putting out multiple guys who just have not been in those roles before. And so, this is a, I think, a good first um, first blush kind of look at, at what Nebraska feels like it can be because we talked about what it looks like on paper. Well, this is the opponent to go out and, and put that into practice. If you have the advantage in terms of starters and, and certainly starting experience and you can get a quality start out of those guys and hand it off to the bullpen, you would think Nebraska can be in some, you know, six to three type games uh, and, and feel pretty good about that. If you go one and three or, or you're struggling throughout, you know, I'll be curious to see why that would be, if, whether that's the offense just hasn't come on track or maybe it's a slow start for some of the pitchers. And, and, you know, sometimes you look at Nebraska openers historically, those first weekends are rough because they haven't been able to get outside. Well, they've been able to get outside quite a bit this year. And, that, and, and so I think that'll prepare them as well. But, you know, I, I, again, two and two, three and one is probably the window that you're looking at. Um, and if you can do that, looking good and, and start to build some confidence in what your strength is and build an identity in what you want to be, uh, then I think you're, you're off and running for, you know, again, a couple big weekends even after this opening one. Evan Bland, a couple more minutes with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Evan, uh, you have a story out. Uh, Alante Brown, Hunter Anthony no longer listed on the Nebraska roster. Uh, level of surprise, or maybe you're not. And, and secondly, you know, how, how big a loss do you think Alante is for the uh, wide receiver room? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think big picture, first of all, it's the first of what we are, you know, having to expect to be double-digit departures. I mean, you just look at the, the simple math of the thing when you have to get down to 85 scholarships. And, you know, even with these departures, Nebraska is still right around 100 you know, you start to look at what that's going to mean. Uh, a lot of that attrition is probably going to come as spring ball gets rolling and guys get a, a better sense of where they stand on depth charts and things like that. So, you know, I think there's a little bit of surprise maybe that those departures would happen now as opposed to after they can get into some more football activities and have a chance to have the staff lay eyes on them and that sort of thing. You know, Hunter Anthony, first of all, 
uh, was a five-year guy. I think he could be an example of somebody who, again, has, has played a lot of college football and, and is maybe just ready for that next step in his life. I mean, he was a, uh, a special teams guy for Nebraska, started at right tackle against Purdue, so he had a little bit of a run there. Um, but, you know, sometimes guys want to move on. Brown is a little bit more of a surprising one, I would say, uh, just from the sense that, he, you know, he was a 2020 recruit, uh, sort of had grown into a bigger role in the offense. And you look at what they brought back outside of Marcus Washington, uh, he, he was sort of the resident veteran in that room. So, uh, you know, I think the door is still probably open to, to seeing what he could do, sort of the way that, that it's been phrased internally is that he's not enrolled this semester. And, and so you can kind of, you know, see where things go here over the course of the next few weeks and next few months. But if you were to leave, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a blow for, for Nebraska. Brown was a high upside kid, you know, quarterback uh, out of Chicago in high school, really athletic, popular among his teammates. And you just think about the, turnover at that wide receiver position the last handful of years um, anybody who's been in the program more than a couple of years is valuable just for the continuity that they can bring and the stability as well so uh, you know we'll see how it ultimately turns out for him but I think again the timing of leaving now with spring ball you know roughly a month away is probably the surprising part you hit on it high upside kid you were just kind of waiting for more uh from Elante Brown, and that's not a knock on him. You're waiting for more opportunity to be earned or, or given to him. Let's see him have a game where he catches the, uh, some passes. You know, let's, let's see seven targets, right? <laughs> Versus uh, a couple, three targets and go try to hurdle a Michigan defender and get a helmet to go, the go, 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 <laughs> go pummel somebody on the edge for, for a bubble because his edge blocking was, was, was fantastic. It was fantastic. And he's a guy that was the after the catch dude that could get you about seven to ten yards. It felt like when they found him. So his athleticism and versatility. I also look at you know Kemp coming in uh, in that slot spot. I mean that that's gonna that's gonna take touches. And if I'm Alante, I see that room, uh, elders, statesmen or not, and I'll probably move on, Evan. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it's hard to say, right? Like in the portal era, there's so many different motivations and you know, I haven't talked to Alante. I don't, I don't know if, if it's more of a competition based thing, if it's, you know, some guys are just homesick. Some guys mm-hmm. want to leave. I mean, you think about the Xavier Betts situation from last year, sometimes guys just are in a mental space where that's not the number one thing to them at that point in time. But yeah, I mean, certainly from uh, when you look at, at, at what this receiver room is becoming with Billy Kemp there and, and Joshua Fleeks, who's worked with Matt Rule before. He's another veteran uh, as, a, as a guy who comes in as a transfer. And then you think of some of these freshmen who are either on campus or coming in, like Jaden Doss, Malachi Coleman, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, there's just a ton of upside moving forward. I still think there's a place for a guy like Alante Brown, who's been on, in on kickoffs and, uh, you know, found a way to contribute in a lot of different areas. By all accounts, he's a high character kid. So I think, you know, I don't think this is a case where Nebraska is running him off. I think they would like to have him on the roster. And again, we'll see ultimately how it shakes out, but should he move on? Um, you know, I, it, I think it will be a loss for Nebraska, but, but maybe not one that they can't overcome with some of the bodies they're bringing in too. Evan, uh, real quick, bud, what's coming up from you uh, with the World Herald? And, again, good stuff today on baseball and football. Yeah, well, we're, uh, you know, baseball kicks off this weekend. Got a number of preview items coming up here. Uh, I have my own Big Ten projections. So anyone who's ready for sort of a download of what the Nebraska baseball team can be, uh, that'll be out here pretty soon i uh, also had a chance with a couple of my colleagues to chat with matt rule here recently so okay. we're going to have a little bit of uh, an update on things here with off-season training and things of that nature too so uh you know it it, it feels like uh, there's never a, a dull moment around here i think that's certainly the case lots going on and, and hopefully people uh, enjoy and, and continue to read hey good stuff as always thanks for making time today evan thanks guys right, there he is evan bland with us Omaha World Herald at uh, Evan Bland OWH on Twitter. Open phones next 20 minutes. Join us here on Hale Varsity presented by Currency. 
And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. You can watch the show, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter at Hale Varsity Twitter. Uh, Hill Varsity Radio at H Varsity Radio, also at uh, KFOR uh, on Twitter and the KFOR Facebook, 489-1240, 489-1240, or 800-825-5865. Those are the numbers to get in uh, as of uh, the 15th of February, 2023. Or as always, this is how I prefer it. Shoot us a tweet. Email? Yeah, Email. Tweet. Shoot us a tweet at Herbal Essences for me, at Schmidt underscore radio for the man sitting next to me. At H Varsity Radio is how uh, you can find the uh, the show on Twitter. I love getting tweets in, so mm-hmm. that's probably my preferred method. I'll take your calls, too, though, if you want to give us a call. And that's uh, a new number for you, 489-1240. It's 402-489-1240. Across the network, uh, whether you're in Central, uh, Western, Northeast, or Omaha, 800-825. 5865, of course, uh, Lincoln, uh, 489-1240. So a little bit of news here personally with uh, my lovely wife, uh, Erin, or a.k.a. The Bunny. Uh, Those of you that have listened to us for a while know I was gone yesterday. She had to have emergency eye surgery. Uh, She's got a patch on. Uh, The sense of humor and relationship we, we have is such that uh, when I have kidney stones, she would send me not-so-nice images of me being a wuss. Uh, (laughs) As a return favor, I was sending her different eye patches to pick out. Uh, So uh, she's she's doing well. That's where I was yesterday. Big thanks to Elijah and Connor for for handling. She's doing all right, except that she's got to be face down for a week uh, as she heals. Uh, But thanks to uh, her for... For her sense of humor through all of this. Uh, it's been not so funny to be a Nebraska football fan. You feel better now about Matt Rule and, and the direction he's going. There's been a lot of positive. The nationally, folks have been, all right, man, you made a great hire in Nebraska. Spring football's just around the corner. So time will tell with how the roster shakes out. We've mentioned Delonte Brown. We've touched on Hunter Anthony no longer on the roster. So if you could pick, right, if you could pick, what what do you bring into the program next? We know that Dylan Riola is forecasted to, to maybe be in, right? Our, our recruiting friends are saying, look, it looks good for Nebraska We'll see. Plenty of time. He wants to make his announcement. Huge visit weekend, March 25th for Nebraska. Him and other four to five stars. Do you want that game changer at quarterback? Do you want the next Dave Remington slash Dean Stein cooler slash Will Shields? Do you want an offensive line great? Yes is the answer to all of this if you're a Nebraska fan, but I'm saying you can pick one. What about defensive line? Do you want the next Sue? Do you want the next Levante David? Do you want another Peter or Wistrom? Give me a Mike Brown in the secondary. Um, Where do you go? And listen, when Nebraska's been great, when they've been championship level, they've had a bunch of guys that have been game changers. Trev Alberts was incredible, and Dominican Sue was incredible. Aaron Taylor, phenomenal. Dominic Raiola, you know, an award winner at center. That's a unit. Your defensive line may have their star, but they've had a good unit. The guy that can flip things is your quarterback. Mm-hmm. Tommy Frazier, Turner Gill, Eric Crouch. Eric Crouch was uh, a, a one-man band that, that drug a team that was good, that was still probably top 10, top 12, to a national championship game. Give me the quarterback. I know that's the easy take, but that's where I'm at. Because I think as a unit, it's nice if you've got a Sue. It's really nice. It's nice if you have a Remington. It's nice if you've got a a Lawrence Phillips and a Mon Green at at IBAC. Okay? They're reliant. Quarterback's reliant, obviously, on the offensive line. But a quarterback can can help uh, ascend a program. As good as Sue was, what they max out at, ten and four. Mm-hmm. Uh, as good as Levante was, what they max out at, ten and four. 
give me that game changer at quarterback because that can really put you over the top when you look at Gill getting by Oklahoma, getting to an, two national championship games. Uh, when you look at Tommy Frazier, I mean, look at that. I mean, the guy, the, the guy was in three championship games in four years. Who's on the line? We've got Chris on the line. Chris, thanks for calling in. Welcome in. Hey, guys. Great show. Um, and uh, thoughts and prayers are, are with your wife or the recovery of her, of her eye quickly. She has just so. texted and threatened my life, so she's doing okay. <laughs> well, I just wondered if you've gotten her fitted for her peg leg and gotten a parrot for her yet. she got to complete the deal. <laughs> Patch, peg leg, parrot. It's a, it's a package deal. We'll, we'll work on the parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Schmidt, you're, you're not the only Chris that's in danger from your wife today. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. That's funny. But I, I, I would go. I, I you know, yeah, you got to build on the line, you know. And when you've got that uh, uh, that rolling, um, you know, you can you can put me back behind there, and I gain. So, you, so, so yards, you would you, you would know? take you would take um, a you would take a game changer offensive lineman over generational quarterback, defensive line, that's your pick, which is fine. Well, I mean, I, I, there's I, not a wrong well, answer. I, I, I guess, I mean, you know, there's just not a whole lot of generational uh, uh, quarterbacks. I mean, you know, if there's, if we know there's, I mean, you know, Texas Tech didn't even know they had Patrick Mahomes, really. When did he win, seven games? You know? Not even. Um, Five and seven every year. Yeah, yeah. So, um I, I would take the pipeline back. I'd want, I'd want to get the pipeline back, and, um, and and the same on defense. You know, it's great to have uh, cornerbacks back there, but if they got to cover for five seconds, no one can do that. No. But you, you know, you've got you got a lineman that's uh, uh, creating havoc. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to have five star guys in the secondary. Um, so, I, I, you know, I go with the line. Okay. And, you know. and I'll make a counterpoint here to Chris. And, Chris, we thank you for your phone call today. 489-1240. And I guess a counterpoint to this whole conversation as a whole is the 2009 Oklahoma team. Do you remember that that, that 2009 Oklahoma team? That, Sam Bradford, McCoy. Uh, Trent Williams at offensive Trent, line. Trent Williams was a, was a tackle. I mean, you, have, you have a generational offensive lineman in Trent Williams. You had a very, very good one of the top three defensive linemen in college football that year in Gerald McCoy. And you had probably the best quarterback in college football, at least top three. Until uh, BYU in, ended his year. But in, yes. in, in Sam Bradford. That team finished 7-5. and five. Well, they did it because Sam Bradford got spiked like he was a party favor in the uh, opener down in Jerry World. Well, so that that helps with your your quarterback argument, but they're still ge- they're <laughs> well, still they're I still ge- that, that's what I'm saying. They're still generational players uh-huh. on that field. Trent Williams and Gerald McCoy, they're not by themselves willing that Oklahoma team to a nine and three, ten and two well, type season. The running back too was phenomenal. Murray, the kid was a, oh yeah yeah he, yeah he was he was a running back. Yeah, listen, I know. Oklahoma finished that year seven and five. They're they're knocking on another championship uh, run if uh, BYU does not end Bradford's season. So you pick one. You can have a generational changing position player for Nebraska football. Do you go quarterback? Do you go running back? Do you go offensive line? Do you go defensive line? Linebacker, secondary. Where are you at? I'm staying obvious. Forgive me, but I'm going to go with that game-changing player at quarterback. And not to mention the butterfly effect it has in recruiting. Mm-hmm. We're Good. Bringing in that high-level quarterback. Oh, now a high-level offensive You're going to win, to come and I'm not them. arguing with you. You're going to win on the line to scrimmage. Absolutely. But the pipeline had stars, had studs. They had Sty. They had Wigert. Uh, of course, they had Graham. They had Dr. Robs. I mean, they had dudes. But they had a they had five of them. <laughs> they had five of them. Who's with us? Yeah, Eric on the line. Eric, thanks for calling. Go ahead, bud. Hey guys, you know you're you're talking about the you know the pipeline. And that just kind of that just kind of you know sparked me up a little bit because I'm a you know I'm a 50 year fan. Mm-hmm. Followed them for a long time. Still have. Uh, you know, I, the way I saw it, and I don't maybe correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but. We had the right chemistry for a lot of years. We seemed to have the right system. Mm-hmm. We had a we had the pipeline. I, I hear people mentioning about you know when you lose, when you know they, they give excuses like when you lose a, a key player on the line, like a, you know like the like the center or somebody. Mm-hmm. 
they give that excuse for the for the team falling apart and not being able to get the job done. But what we had in the past in the pipeline was a combination of things. We had we had player development that was very successful. Yes. Where you you didn't have to be a four or five star player to fit in there. You could we could develop them into that guy that that plugged in when we need him. Didn't have to be a star, but but did the job. You know. You had a five star. It was really important. You had a five star unit, didn't you? And then you had backups yeah, already. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's what I'd like to see now. I want to see them. I want to see that that interchangeability. You can have your five stars on there, but I want to see the interchangeability that keeps us, uh, you know, alive if the chips are down or if we're, you know, if we're up against, uh, you know, some challenges. You know. Absolutely. Appreciate so, the phone call. Thank you so much. And Eric, to, to your point, I mean, look at what Cam Jurgens did with that Husker offensive line last year. He elevated them, he, but there, there's still four other guys. That, Cam Jurgens was probably the best offensive lineman we've seen at Nebraska in eight years. A while. Yeah. A while. And the look fact how, is, is there's still four guys next to him that aren't reaching his level in the offensive line as a whole suffer. So that one generational player on the offensive line isn't going to help you unless you got four guys around him. Well, and that's why I'm being the, ah, oh, it's obvious. Let's go quarterback. No, and, and yeah, you need the unit, you need the depth. We'll squeeze in one more phone call, 489-1240 here on Hale Varsity Radio. Who's with us? Got Neil on the line. Neil, thanks for calling. Go ahead, bud. Hey, it's Dale, not Neil. Dale, oh, Dale, Dale. Dale. Fire away, that, That's Dale. my fault, you've around, Dale. You've been around Lincoln just as long as I have. Mm-hmm. So what's, what's your take on the history of Nebraska's walk-on that basically went away? I mean, you and I both remember the mm-hmm. 70s and 80s when you had all these beef-fed Nebraska players mm-hmm. that grew up on the farm, could throw a 120-pound bale of hay three lays higher on the hay rack, and they could move mountains and push everyone around. Dale, I got football a, for Nebraska, and then uh, they went home and raised the farm. Uh, Dale, I got I got Listen, it, it's it's still important. That mentality has got to be recaptured. You've got to get got got to go get those kids, and you got to keep them. That's the trick. They're going elsewhere now. And I mean, it's it's, it's easier gotta, for other schools to find these guys, and you've got to identify them, and you're going to start doing that presumably with communication because of the high school coaches the entire state has a a, a phone call and a bat line out of the rural staff which is good thanks for the call and now and now back to hail varsity radio Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert is with us. Dr. Brandon, how's your hamstrings doing? And they're feeling a little bit after that hike this morning. Yeah, they're kind of on fire right now, so I think tomorrow uh, the going to be a little sore moving around. Well, give your pal Zion uh, a phone call down in New Orleans. Uh, uh, he has uh, decided to reemerge as uh, another candidate for most talked about athlete with our jock docs over the years. 26 games is it this season for the number Former number one pick overall, Zion Williamson, multiple weeks. Uh, the setback with his right hamstring, Dr. Brandon, and a lot of NBA fans, specifically those in New Orleans, rolling their eyes. But when you have hamstring issues, it really is kind of a day-to-day thing, isn't it? Yeah, it really is kind of a day-to-day. That's a great way to describe that, Chris. You know, so we talk about hamstrings. Most folks know what hamstrings are, but we'll do a little anatomic uh, uh, recap for that. So think of anatomy, hamstrings, basically feel in the back side of your thigh. There's a, a couple of muscle groups back there. So it's your hamstring musculature. And the, basically what happens most of the time is you tend to have a strain kind of right in the mid portion of the muscle portion of it. Um, obviously you start to go to a different level when you start to have injuries in the tendinous portion. That'd be the top and bottom part of the muscle that attaches it onto the bone. And that kind of takes you in a different category. They're not being real specific about where his is, but kind of based on what the timetable they've laid out and his rehab program, it sounds like it's probably more a muscle belly type of injury. 
Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us here. It's a Jock Doc Wednesday. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And Dr. Brandon, one of the things that they said whenever he re-aggravated this injury was that he was diligent in his, his work coming back from the hamstring injury. And he aggravated uh, whenever they tried to ramp him up to three on three and he didn't do anything wrong. But it sounds like he is he's pretty disappointed uh, because of how diligent he was in his rehab and now how long he's been rehabbing for. So how much of this becomes a, a mental thing for Zion Williamson trying to get back on the floor? Yeah, you know, there's always that key. That's a great point, Elijah. There's always that issue with whenever you go back with these injuries, obviously that back of your mind thought of, all right, if I you know, just step a little bit quicker here, jump a little higher here, is this thing going to tweak? Is this going to go off again? And so that's always there. And so there's kind of that run-in period where you have to kind of work through that part of it. So no doubt that's, that's an issue for him. But more importantly, you know, hamstrings just in general, unfortunately, are pesky when you first go back. A lot of athletes will have kind of that retweak event and, you kind of have this stepwise kind of approach to going back where, yeah, you're going to play like a little bit of tweak, maybe rest for a day or two, then you go back, or maybe you don't play the whole game. It's kind of this stepwise return to play program. That can be pretty helpful, but also quite frustrating as an athlete because you really do feel like you just kind of retweak that thing pretty frequently in the first couple of months when you return. Doctors and medical staff will communicate with Zion. Zion will give his feedback. Here's how my body's feeling. But from a standpoint of imaging, you know, what, what is the, the medical staff's task, Dr. Brandon, with being able to, to use equipment to follow through with, with the, the feedback you're getting from the athlete? Is it beyond words or, or physical field? Do you guys use imaging or, or equipment or technology to, to verify? Yeah, Chris, that's a great question. So, you know, it's always interesting kind of looking at how imaging is used at, you know, different levels. Um, obviously, once you kind of get to that, you know, high-level NFL, NBA-type level, I mean, you pretty much have anything at your disposal in terms of what teams will spend, agents will spend on, you know, evaluating things. So, in his scenario, I'm sure it probably, you know, obviously maybe got some x-rays, but for sure I probably have not this already. Maybe they've even ultrasounded it. And that's kind of the high-end kind of imaging route you would take. Honestly, for most of these, you don't need the imaging. For me, the imaging is important if you start to have issues, again, near the tendinous portions. In particular, if you kind of feel up towards the top of that hamstring, where those hamstrings attach is onto an anatomic structure, kind of basically people call it your sit bone. It's called your ischial tuberosity. If patients have pain over that area, you know, one, they tend to have a you know, higher grade injury to the hamstring. They tend to have a lot more pain than, like, your typical muscle strain or a mid-belly strain. And so if folks have pain in that area, I'm always MRI just to make sure, because that's an area where you have to think about surgical intervention if they do have a tear where that basically originates off that issue of tuberosity. And so that's kind of how I use the imaging modality. The other time I'll use imaging on these would be in somebody who's had kind of chronic hamstring issues. Um, that could be a scenario where we might be thinking about utilizing some kind of therapeutic injection, something like a PRP we've talked about that plays at rich plasma. Those are pretty nice injections to use kind of in our chronic either A, hamstring tendonitis or kind of your chronic kind of hamstring strain patients. Those can be quite helpful. And so imaging can help kind of guide you as to where that pathology is mainly located. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Dr. Brandon, what Schmidt led off this interview by saying was Zions might be holding the record for the most talked about athlete on here. He's up there with Bryce Harper. And Dr. Brandon, whenever, whenever you look at this, you look back at the injury history, his rookie season, he missed almost the entire year, played in just 20 games uh, because of a knee injury. Then he got 61 games his second year in the league. Third year in the league, he missed the entire year with a foot injury. Now he's dealing with the hamstring injury. With all these being lower body, can you see these being related in any way, or is this just an unlucky guy? Yeah, that's always a tough debate. Again, it's, it's an interesting thought to think about that for him. Um, you know, there could be a variety of things. It sure, it sure could be. You know, he might be one of those athletes that just has that kind of super – kind of lax body type where those tissues are really lax. And again, we've talked about this before. It's like those kind of athletes that kind of ride that fine line of being, you know, just kind of loose enough to be you know, quicker, faster, better than others, jump higher than others, you know, throw harder than others. But yet, once you start to cross over that line, now you start to have these things pop up, the hannies, you know, the ACL issues, cartilage issues, meniscus issues. And so he's most likely one of those folks. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, you start to ask questions about, you know, have we reached that kind of peak physiology where we have pushed ourselves so far and, you know, the athleticism that's been developed you know, through weightlifting nutrition, 
might be maxing out where that person really is supposed to be. And so your other structures that, you know, essentially are your natural structures that you can't necessarily make stronger, such as you know, tendons, ligaments, those types of things. Maybe he's one of those that has kind of maxed his body out physiologically. And every time he's out there playing, he's just pushing and firing at such a high rate that his tendons and ligaments are just not prepared for that. All I know is good for him having guaranteed money. Think about Zion in the NFL where you're you're, you're not even at 50% when it comes to career games available versus career games played. And it's been no joke uh, to Elijah's point uh, with the knee injury, the foot issue. Those are horrific. And, and then the hamstrings. So... Uh, best wishes for Zion Williamson, great ball player down in New Orleans moving forward. Last thought here, Dr. Brandon Seifert, about 30 seconds. Is there anything Zion can do uh, aside from being in shape? Yeah, you know, for him, it's always such a huge part of got to make sure that those kind of hip muscle groups have been you know, worked appropriately. A lot of our athletes, even though they look physically fantastic, still a lot of those athletes have kind of that hip abductor weakness that can be part of it. So focusing on that, the flexibility piece is always huge. And then you start to look at folks and you kind of start to add up all that volume of games they've played. And do you start maybe limiting some of their playing time, um, limiting some games, maybe taking in some scheduled rest along the season, knowing that he's somebody that's fairly injury prone. I know those are some controversial things they have to decide, but that might be something you have to think about. Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a jock doc Wednesday. Dr. Brandon, enjoy the desert. Thanks for a few minutes today. All right, guys. You all take care. Thanks again. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out Wednesday, Hail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Miss any of the show, if you're new to the show, uh, we're invited to check the podcast out, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, uh, the entire show, or just different segments. Big thanks to Mike Babcock, Mike Shuhart, and Evan Bland from the World Herald. Check their segments out. Check the whole thing out. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. You can see the whole video. We've shifted quite a bit to the, 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 the stream side of things from a video standpoint. Hail Varsity's YouTube channel. Great content. All the, the writers and analysts with Hail Varsity right there. And uh, subscribe to that page, Hail Varsity Radio Twitter. Follow that, watch the show, and check us out here uh, in Lincoln on KFOR Facebook, on KFOR Twitter, at KFOR Radio. So do that. That's the the move today, 101.5 FM and then 1240 AM. Uh, Of course, always on in Omaha, 590 ESPN Omaha. Central Nebraska, the uh, ESPN Superstation, and then uh, News Talk 900 in Columbus. So those are ways to hear us on the radio, stream us uh, on uh, KFORnow.com and uh, wherever else you choose to stream and how you choose to stream, totally up to you. Fun discussion about what position you would take from a generational talent. What what would you want someone from the offensive line, defensive line, a quarterback, a running back, wide out, linebacker? Uh, good discussion there. More emails on that. Uh, the wife has emailed in. Uh, more verbal abuse in language I cannot share on the radio, but she, she just tells us, in response to Chris's call, not me, but caller Chris, she does not need nor want a parrot as as a as a another pet. Well, let me just Aaron. It's been nothing but love from me today. Like <laughs> I, I have said nothing bad. I I, I covered yesterday while the you lovely wife, the bunny. I, I, all my thoughts are with you at this sure. time, Aaron. No, the, the <laughs> my wife. Uh, bless her heart. Best thing ever. Uh, I had to have uh, emergency eye surgery. She's doing great. She's not a happy person because she's got to stay face down for a week. And 
because out, out of love, people are suggesting we we get her a parrot to to get her, a, a, you know, to go with the eye patch. It's pretty funny. It's <laughs> that's, that's really good. That's that's uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna wake up and I, she's gonna she's gonna pull a Lieutenant Dan on me, man. She's gonna <laughs> rip me down from the bed and and go uh, make me frightened. Uh, on one hand, I can see how it's uh, funny for us, and I can also see how it's not funny for her being forced oh, to lay face down for no, the next week. No, no. She, she did start watching Seinfeld. And you're like, well, duh. No, I know. Seinfeld's incredible. But she has started the adventure of, of Seinfeld streaming that. I don't know what season she's on now, but she's probably been cranking away on Seinfeld all day. You guys got to watch The Last of Us on HBO Max. It's based on a video game that I used to like back in the day. Uh, it's about kind I've of heard a of it. post-apocalyptic with Pedro Pascal. And yeah, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a sci-fi guy. Oh no, you'd like this. You'd All like right, this. Like beyond Star Wars, I'm not a sci-fi guy. Oh, it's not. Just try it out. Back tomorrow at four on Hail Varsity Radio. Jabba Chamberlain with us, Gary Barnett, Brandon Vogel. We'll talk to you at four. Thanks.